interesting. So, Jeff, let me let me just uh, follow up on some of those. This Jeff on some of those questions. Um, um, how would you put ipilimumab versus interferon? How would you rate those two based on your knowledge of of these data? I think ipi is probably a better drug than high dose interferon. It if, when selling this or or presenting this to patients, the way I present it is that you can get a drug with a very modest survival benefit of 2 to 3 percent, which is what was detected in the meta-analyses in the adjuvant setting, in exchange for almost a certain guarantee of a year's worth of feeling lethargic, fatigued, tired, having night sweats and feverishness. So everybody has some side effect when they go in into Furon, or almost everyone. And it's not always debilitating. People get through the day. Uh, they, some of them even keep working, but they don't feel well for a whole year, and even a few months thereafter. And I always tell them, one day you'll wake up a few months after finishing your year, and you'll feel like a human being again, versus rolling the dice and going on IPI, where maybe 10, 15 percent of the patients are going to have some serious, even potentially life-threatening side effects, but the remaining patients, the majority, will have no serious or significant side effects. They might have itching or rash, but really not severe, and it enables them to get on with their life. Some people have absolutely no side effects with IPI, none, and do very well. I would say most patients will opt for the ipilimumab as opposed to the interferon. I would agree with that in our, in our, in our hands. Uh, it, it initially was tough, but it was initially tough in the metastatic setting also. Understand that time has passed and the community is, is now more uh, comfortable with ipilimumab. We have better uh, treatment algorithms for the toxicities. And if it gets approved, I doubt that it will get approved in the way that it was in this uh, European trial for three years of therapy and a 10 milligram dose. So, so can I ask sort of as a, as a surgeon then, because often my patients ask me sort of when, I'm, when I refer them to the medical oncologist, we always have this discussion. And there are a couple of things that I always sort of, uh, that I am concerned about from this perspective. Um, Going with the uh, ipilimumab for these patients, then, um, does the cost um, outweigh the potential benefit from this? And the second thing al also with this is how do we select the patients that will benefit from this ipilimumab? Because if we have then a 10% difference, it truly you need to, to treat uh, ten, you know, 10 patients to benefit one patient. How do we select these patients that will benefit from ipilimumab? If it has this added toxicity, at least at 10 milligrams per kilogram. Well, right now we don't have a good predictive marker, which everyone would love to have to predict who would benefit best from IPI. So we're, again, back in the old empiric era where we're treating 100 to benefit 10 or even fewer. So there is no way to easily select those patients. That being said, I, I think actually we have more of a filter, and I'll be interested in what my colleagues say. Uh, with, with interferon, I generally won't treat someone over the age of 70, 75 with high-dose interferon. Whereas with IPI, um, uh, you can treat patients into their 80s without any major issues. Um, I would say it's probably easier to treat people with IPI than with a year of interferon. And, and in this then, uh, for these patients, one thing that we have not spoken about is, is um, biochemotherapy for these patients. Uh, we know that there's the SWOG 0008 study. So you have the 33-year-old woman who uh, is active and has a 3B or 3C disease. Um, would you give them biochemotherapy then? Because we know that the recurrence free survival, at least in that study, was over two years improvement with the biochemotherapy compared to interferon. And it's uh, three months compared to doing something for a year. But it's a tough three months. It's a very tough Very three tough three months. It's also a... Um, hospitalization um, and what you're looking at is true relapse free survival benefit but no true overall survival benefit there are some questions about the time points that patients came back for evaluation for and in, in with the biochemotherapy arm so it's clearly that's for us it, I look at it a different way uh, without the approval of Yervoy in the adjuvant setting, it seems that the biochemotherapy may have benefited the higher stage patients. I somehow think of it differently for interferon than you do, Dr. Sossman, because the absolute benefit in 
relapse-free survival is greater in the, in the lower stage patients. So we have a, a discussion about the high risk of recurrence, the morbidity of recurrence, and with biochemotherapy, we go through an extensive uh, discussion, almost like a clinical trial. Actually, I think the high dose interferon that's been given in the United States, if you look at each of the three trials that have been published, the, the benefit in the groups have all varied. So it's very hard to make any statement about the benefit being more significant or more obvious in the low risk group. Now the pegylated intron data from the Europeans definitely showed that interferon did not, um, uh, did not really have a significant benefit in the higher stage patients and was mainly in the stage three nodal microscopic patient. But that study, actually, if you look at that study and you look at subsequent presentations, you know, the benefit was entirely in the ulcerated patient population. So if you're going to use that study, and I, I do actually use that information to some degree in making um, an attempt at an educated decision, and uh, I, would, I would certainly consider interferon more in the ulcerated, higher-risk patients. Ulcerated stage 3 patients. Stage 3 yeah, patients. Yeah, that's how I use PEG interferon or Xylitron. I think that's a reasonable evidence-based decision. If someone has sentinel node-only disease with a, an ulcerated primary, I would definitely offer them uh, pegylated interferon, absolutely. And I try to give it to them for at least three years, although admittedly in the EORTC trial, it was actually a five-year regimen, as I remember. And the average patient went about three years. So that's, that's a long haul. And, and I imagine you use dose reductions as needed yeah, to keep absolutely. them on therapy that period of time. We have a lot of experience with PEG interferon in, in actually metastatic trials, some of which are very interesting. And we do dose adjust the PEG intron to uh, match a performance status of zero or one. In other words, to maintain the quality of life. So in that study then, um, are you concerned at all about that this was a sub-analysis that was not originally planned into the study? It's and it's also, if you look at the number of patients in each of the groups, it's, uh, it's about 90 or less patients in each group. That's correct. That's right. In the ulcerated primary microscopic nodal, those are the ones that benefited not only in uh, relapse survival, but distant metastases-free survival and overall survival. It was about 95 patients in each arm. What we're going to find out more about is what the ulceration really meant, because EORTC is now looking at a trial of stage two ulcerated patients of PEG intron versus placebo, and they're looking at two years since uh, 18991, the median was about 14 months. I think in that, though, they are really looking at a very different patient population because these are not patients with microscopic metastatic disease. These are patients Absolutely, that are Absolutely, I agree with you. So I think it's, the challenge is to sort of draw any conclusions from the data they presented with ulcerated microscopic metastatic and draw that to then an even earlier patient population. I still, I don't think we know what the ben potential benefit, if any, will be in that. Although area. the majority of the outcome in those patients, I would predict, would not be by their sentinel node positivity. If you have a microscopic sentinel node positive patient, I would say the majority of the outcome is dictated by their four millimeter ulcerated primary with mitosis. But again, these are also two Bs and, and two Cs, so these are not just the, uh, these are less than four millimeters ulcerated. So, so, so yeah, I would like but, to, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, Merrick, please but, go but, ahead. But, I, but you're right, I mean, I think um, it's a different patient population, but it's still looking at ulceration as a biomarker for potential prediction of, uh, of interference for that patient population. You're right, you can't extrapolate from the threes, from the threes in ulceration, but you'll get information about the, 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 the stage two patients that are ulcerated, and that will be an interesting biomarker, at least a test of that biomarker, as a predictive, uh, uh, predictive marker for response to interferon. So I have one more question.